Okay, so today we want to prove the independence of this notion that the Cartan matrix the <coughs> Dinkin diagram does not depend on this linear functional f that we chose to construct them. Uh, so this is going to require, this requires studying the Weil group. And I'll need some help to know what the hell Jethro said before during the class. So I'll define this as a subgroup of, <clears throat> so this is going to be something that depends on the root system. And I'll define this as a subgroup of the orthogonal group of V. Uh, did Jethro define what the Weil group is for a root system? No. Okay, so the nodes, well, okay, so then, then we'll, we might not get to prove this by the end, but let's, let's see how we get. So, <coughs> okay, so do we know what this is, right? So this space V, so let's suppose that we have a root system. Then in particular, V has a, an inner product that we can extend to the real numbers. And we define this group O of V to be the subgroup of GLV. So these are elements inside automorphisms of the vector space, a linear automorphism of the vector space, such that A V A W is equal to V W for every V and W in V. Okay, so our are linear automorphisms of V that preserve the inner product. And I want to define a finite subgroup of this orthogonal group uh, <coughs> of permutations of the roots. So for each alpha in delta, we will consider the reflection respect to alpha. <coughs> and this guy is, well, this is going to be an endomorph, an automorphism of V defined as R alpha of V is equal to V minus two times V alpha over alpha alpha times alpha. <coughs> okay. So the first observation is that this thing is actually inside of O of V. Well, actually, let's prove that it's also inside of GLV. Okay. <coughs> but that's kind of clear. It's clear that if you look at, uh, well, alpha is inside of delta, and delta doesn't have zero, so this alpha is non-zero itself. And you can break this V into, uh, well, if I look at the real vector, I don't remember if, I don't know if Jethro defined this vector space as a vector space over the rational numbers, over the real numbers. I'm considering this V with this inner product with values on the real numbers. So I'm gonna just write VR to be the real vector space. And you can break this as alpha plus everything that is perpendicular to that. <coughs> and it's perpendicular with respect to the inner product that you have, which is a positive definite inner product. So in this breakup, then any vector that is here, so if you plug in alpha for V, you notice that is minus alpha because you just pick up alpha minus twice alpha. <coughs> and everything that is perpendicular stays the same if V is perpendicular to alpha. So the eigenvalues of R alpha are one in this vector space and minus one in this subvector space. And R is therefore, well, <coughs> has determinant of R alpha 
is equal to minus 1. Sorry? I don't know what the definition of that the Jethro gave. Typically, I would define this thing as a finite subset of a rational vector space. And then you prove that this inner product actually has rational values over uh, roots. Uh, but anyways, I'm just taking this. If you wish, if V was defined over the rationals, then take that definition as this. And that's just the real extension. In any case, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this reflection has, leaves an co-dimension one subspace invariant, and it just sends alpha to minus alpha on the other, on the direction of alpha. So it's, it is a reflection. In particular, this is an orthogonal transformation. All the eigenvalues are of norm one. So R alpha is inside is inside of O V. <coughs> well, this proves that it's inside of GLV, but it's trivial to check that it's inside of O V. <coughs> now, uh, OK, so now we have this. So now I can define this group W then. W is, by definition, it is the subgroup, the subgroup of O of V generated by our alphas for all alpha in delta. And I claim that W is a finite subgroup inside of instead of all three. <clears throat> well, the first observation is that, to, to prove this, let's notice that you have a morphism of groups from W to the automorphisms of delta. Let me just, the bijections from delta to delta. Uh, and this follows because our alpha of beta is inside of delta for every beta in delta. And this is the string property. By the string property, alpha minus uh, twice beta alpha over alpha alpha. Al oops, beta minus this. This is in the string. Of, of roots coming from uh, beta by adding multiples of alpha. <clears throat> so, well, it's in that string, that string contains zero, but we know that that thing cannot be zero because our alpha of something is invertible. Okay. So in principle, a string may pass by zero, but this thing is non-zero, and it is in that string, therefore it is a root. So this means that this is a root. So this means that every R alpha sends delta to delta. So this follows, it follows that R alpha of delta is inside of delta and it's invertible. Therefore, R alpha of delta needs to be delta. So every generator of this group preserves delta. It doesn't preserve it pointwise, but it preserves the set. Therefore, every element of W permutes the roots of delta. So you get a morphism like this, and I claim that this morphism is injective. <clears throat> so now, now for any element of the vial group, you get a permutation of the roots. And if W is in the kernel of this morphism, so let's call this guy to be phi. So if phi of W is equal to the identity, that means that W of alpha is equal to alpha for every uh, alpha in delta. And this is absurd because <clears throat> delta contains a basis for V. So if it fixes a basis of V, then it fixes all of V, and that means that W is the identity. So this means that W uh, fixes a basis 
of V. And this implies <coughs> that W fixes V. And this implies W is the identity of V. So the kernel of this morphism is trivial, and that means that W is inside of this space, and this space, this set is finite because it's just bounded. Well, it is the number of elements in delta factorial. Okay, so that's the number of elements in this set. So that means that W is finite. <coughs> okay, so we have a finite subgroup of the orthogonal group of the vector space V, and okay, so let's 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 play with this group. Okay, uh, let me prove the following theorem. So first of all, let's, let's now choose a linear functional f. So let now f be a linear functional such that f of alpha is different from zero for every alpha in delta. So remember that this gave us, therefore, the notion of a simple root system and a positive root system and so forth. Uh, so let, so this simple root system, let's suppose that this is alpha 1 up to alpha r, where r is the dimension of v. So let's define si to be r alpha i. So these are the simple reflections. The reflections across the roots, the simple roots alpha i and not just arbitrary roots. <coughs> so theorem. A. So all of delta plus minus alpha i is stable by si two or b. W is generated by these simple reflections. Uh, do I want to stop there? Let's just stop there. Let's prove this too. Uh, actually, let's see. Once we have a simple root system, we can define the height of a root. So define for alpha in delta plus the height of alpha to be the sum of ki, where alpha is the sum of ki alpha i. There's a unique way of writing a positive root as a linear combination of simple roots where all these coefficients ki are positive numbers, positive integer numbers, non-negative integer numbers. So let's just define the height of a root to be the sum of those numbers. Okay. So if you have that definition, then there exists for any alpha like this, which is not simple, uh, so for every alpha in delta plus minus pi, there exists an i such that the height of si alpha is less than the height of alpha. So you can always reduce the height of a root by applying a simple reflection. So let's prove these things. Okay, so let's take the first one. So we have our alpha, which is a positive root, so we can write it as a sum of ki. Oh, I want to prove that it, there exists an i, right? Yeah. Uh, so let's write it as a sum of kj alpha j, <coughs> where all these kj's are post bigger or equal than zero, and at least one of them is non-zero. And moreover, since alpha is not alpha i, then that means that there exists some j naught which is different than i such that k j naught is bigger than zero. Okay. 
That's because alpha is not alpha i. So it has at least one appearance of one other simple root. But then let's apply si to alpha. And this is the sum of kj. Well, <clears throat> so what can happen? This, this root is either positive or negative. <clears throat> okay? So this thing is this. It's alpha minus alpha, alpha i, divided by alpha i, alpha i, times alpha i. And this is an integer number by the string property. This alpha was a root. And this alpha is just written like this. So it's the sum of kj alpha i, j minus this integer number. Oh, there's a 2 there. Alpha, alpha i over alpha i, alpha i times alpha i. <coughs> so this means that si of alpha okay, can subtract out of this expression, some multiple of alpha i, but the coefficient, the coefficient of alpha j naught stays the same. <coughs> so the coefficient of alpha j naught stays the same. In particular, it's positive. But now you know that if you have a root and you express it as a linear combination of simple roots, then all the coefficients are either all positive or all, they're all negative. So that means that the full coefficients, so all positive, so this means that all coefficients are positive, well, not negative. So this means that Si of alpha is in delta plus. And it cannot be, and it's clearly, and also, Si of alpha is not alpha i, because if Si of alpha was alpha i, then that meant that, remember that Si inverse of alpha i is equal to minus alpha i. Okay? So Si of alpha is a positive root, and it cannot be alpha i, therefore it is inside of this, which is what I wanted to prove. So this proves a. OK, so let's prove that W is generated. Well, let's prove C first. C is going to imply B. So I want to prove that I can't find, for any positive root that is not simple, I can find a simple root. I can find a simple root that has a lower height than it. Okay. Oh, I just wanted to prove that Si of alpha, so I just proved that Si of alpha is positive because it has one coefficient that is non-negative, which is alpha zero, j0. Zero. But I also wanted to prove that it's not only possible, uh, positive. I need to check that it has to be in, uh, it has to be in delta plus minus alpha i. So if Si of alpha was alpha i, then Alpha was Si inverse of alpha i, and Si inverse of alpha i is minus alpha i, which is cannot, cannot be because, SI of, because alpha is was positive. By the way, I mean, these are reflections. It's clear that Si inverse is equal to Si. OK, so right. So let's prove this, this statement. So let's start with this again. So we start with our alpha, which is some sum of k i alpha i. So the height of alpha is equal to the sum of these k i's. And s, well, s j of alpha is equal to alpha minus twice alpha alpha j 
alpha j alpha j times alpha j. So that means that the height, well, the height of S j of alpha is equal to well, is this linear combination. So this is going to be the sum of all the skis that I had before minus this number, twice alpha alpha j alpha j alpha j. <clears throat> now. I claim that, so what we need to prove is that there exists one j such that this thing is less than this number, right? So I'm looking for, I want to prove that there exists one j such that this thing is less than the sum of the ki's. That's what we want. So equivalently, we want to find that there exists one j such that this thing is positive. So this is what we want. So let's assume the contrary. So let's assume, assume by contradiction, that 2 alpha j alpha alpha j over alpha j alpha j is less or equal than 0 for every j. So if that thing happens, then let's look at the inner product of alpha with itself. So we look at alpha, inner product with alpha, and this thing here is the inner product of alpha with the sum of ki alpha i. That's how we describe this alpha i. And this is the sum, oops, ki i alpha i. So this is the sum of ki with alpha alpha i. <coughs> but now, if this thing is negative for every j, then also this thing is negative for every j, because this guy was positive and 2 is positive. So this implies that this thing here is less or equal than 0, but alpha with alpha is bigger or equal than 0. And if alpha is non-zero, this is bigger than 0. So that's absurd. So this, is, this proves C. OK, so now B is just the, state, is the following statement. So to prove B, we now know the following. By induction, by induction, uh, on the height of alpha, for every alpha that, that belongs to delta plus minus pi, there exists some w, which is a product of simple roots, SI1, SIK, such that W of alpha is in pi. OK, so let's prove that statement. If you give me an alpha that is not in pi, then the height of alpha is bigger than 1. The height is the sum of the coefficients Ki. So if the height of a root is 1, if and only if, that root is simple. So if the height of alpha, if alpha is in delta plus and is not in pi, then the height is bigger than 1. By applying C, I can find a simple root such that the height of this thing is, less than, is 1 less. So by applying several of those reflections, eventually I'm going to re reduce the height to be 1. Therefore, the product of these things applied to alpha is, has height 1, therefore it's in pi. Okay, so this statement is, is trivial. Uh, the second observation we want to make is that, well, re recall that this thing here is not an arbitrary linear element aut automorphism of V, but it's an orthogonal automorphism of V. So what I want to prove is, what, what we need to prove is that this orthogonal group actually acts on uh, the vial group. 
It acts by, by conjugation. So the orthogonal group acts by conjugation, and it acts on, on W. So that's a nice lemma. So let's prove it separately. Lemma for, for A in O of V and W, <coughs> actually, let's, let's not do this for W, and uh, alpha in delta, I haven't defined what I'm going to prove now, but okay. So A R alpha A inverse is equal to R of A alpha Let me tell you what R of A alpha is. Because in principle, A alpha does not need to be in delta. And I've only defined reflections across roots in delta. So for any W, non-zero in V, define RW to be, ah, W is a bad name. I'm using W for elements in the Weil group. So for any vector V, I'm using the definition. So let's say V prime, which is non-zero in V, define R V prime to be the reflection which takes V and it gives you back two V V prime, V prime, V prime, V prime. Okay. <clears throat> OK, so we need to prove that statement. <coughs> so let's grab V, and let's apply A R alpha A inverse to that. So this goes to A inverse V. Then it goes to R alpha of A inverse V. And this, by definition, is A inverse V minus twice A inverse V alpha over alpha alpha alpha. <coughs> but uh, A is orthogonal. So A of A inverse V, A alpha is equal to this inner product. So this thing there is equal to A inverse V minus twice V R A alpha over A alpha A alpha. So this is equal to this because A is orthogonal, and this is equal to the numerator because A is orthogonal. And here I have alpha. And the last thing that I need to apply is A to that. So A is linear, implies that, well, now I'm going to apply A to this thing. I'm going to get A of A inverse of V, that's V, minus twice. A is linear, so I can just take this number out of A. V A alpha over A alpha, A alpha. Uh, and now apply A to just alpha. Okay, so I have I've applied the three of them. I've gotten that. And this, by definition, is the same thing as R of A alpha applied to V. Okay? So, <coughs> so this statement follows. In particular, you can take A to be an element in the Weyl group, which is an orthogonal element, an orthogonal transformation. So, root, but it's not simple. We found W such that W alpha is equal to some element in, in, uh, in the simple root system. So let's just take it to be alpha i. <coughs> we found this W, and W was a product of simple reflections. And now the lemma says that R of W inverse alpha i 
this is the same thing as R alpha. W inverse of alpha i is, is, uh, is alpha. And this thing is equal to, well, W inverse uh, R uh, alpha i w, which is w inverse s i w. Now, every reflection for a positive root, therefore, is a product of simple reflections. So, so all r alphas for alpha positive is a product. Well, it's in the subgroup. In the subgroup. of W generated by simple reflections. And finally, R minus alpha is equal to R alpha, because it's a reflection. So <coughs> a reflection along, well, it doesn't matter. Just take, it, take the formula, R minus V prime put in a minus here, takes this minus and a plus, but then a minus there puts it back a minus, and this inner product is invariant if I take V prime to be V prime or minus V prime. So this equality holds. So that means that any R alpha for any alpha in delta is in the subgroup generated by these SIs, and therefore B is proved. Okay. So <clears throat> now we know that every element in the Weyl group can be written as a product of simple reflections. So that gives us, once we've chosen this f, this gives a notion in the Weyl group, which is the height or the length of an element in the Weyl group. And we're going to use that later on, but let's define it now. So by choosing F. Otherwise, we don't have the notion of simple reflection. So the simple reflection was, a, was the outcome of choosing a simple root system. By choosing F, we get this notion of the length of W, which is the minimum number of simple reflections that you need. Okay? So you write W to be a product of SI1. That now you know that it exists like this. So choose the minimum such. Minimum. K. In particular, the length being one is that you're a simple re reflection. Well, the, the length being zero, it means that you're the identity. <clears throat> okay, and there's only one element with length zero. All right. So, so now we're going to need. So th th this vector space to be real. So consider the hyperplane T alpha in V defined as, so this is the orthogonal hyperplane to alpha. So these are the elements V in V, the real V, such that V alpha is equal to zero. So if you have a real vector space and you just take out a co-dimension one subspace, uh, this gives you two connected components on that real vector space. And the two connected components on the real vector space minus this T alpha. So VR minus T alpha is a disconnected space. It has two connected components, and it consists of vectors that are where this inner product is positive or this inner product is negative. Okay. So what you can do is look at V R and take out all of these spaces. It doesn't matter if you take alpha uh, positive or al or alpha in delta. Certainly. If V alpha is equal to zero, V minus alpha is equal to zero. So this, it doesn't matter if you just take here the union over delta or delta plus of T alpha. <clears throat> so consider that space as a topological space with the usual topology. So it's a topological space. 
is a subspace of VR with its usual topology. Now, this space is not connected, is no longer connected as VR was. So since this is not connected, let's just write it as a disjoint union of connected components. So these are just the connected components of this topological space. And these connected components are known as the vial chambers. So these are the vial chambers. That's the definition. Vial chambers are disconnected components of this. Notice that the notion of vial chamber does not depend at all on f. This only depends on delta. It uses delta. It does not use pi. OK. So let's do some examples on this. So let's take rank two systems, which are the only ones that I can draw. OK? So if we look at A2, the root system looks like this. So here are the simple roots, alpha 1 and alpha 2. And this is alpha 1 plus alpha 2. And these are all the positive roots. And T alpha 1 is this perpendicular space, so this is T alpha 1. T alpha 2 is, ah, I'm horrible drawing. This looks like a 90 degrees, and this shouldn't be 90 degrees. Let's draw this properly. Someone should draw for this for me. OK, so let's suppose that this is alpha 1. And let's suppose that this looks like 60 degrees, perhaps. That more or less looks like 60 degrees. Let's suppose that's true. Probably like this. OK, so now it looks a little bit more like it. This is T alpha 1. And now this is T alpha 2. Here is alpha 2. And somewhere like here is T alpha 1 plus alpha 2. And the connected components are six of them. This is one connected component. This is the other, is other connected component. This is other connected component, and so forth. OK? So. I'll define the fundamental chamber, and this will depend on uh, the notion of F, or the simple root system. So definition, the fundamental chamber is C0 is defined to be the collection of vectors V and V, such that V inner product with alpha i is bigger than 0 for every i, in, well, for every alpha i in pi. So in this case, are the things that are for alpha 1 on the left of alpha 1 and for alpha 2 on this upper side. So this is the fundamental chain. So the first lemma is that the fundamental chamber is a chamber. It's one of these connected components. I've defined the set of chambers as connected components of uh, this space, which is just VR minus all these hyperplanes. So let's prove that it's, this fundamental chamber is such a connected component. What is clear is that this C0, since every vector in C0 has inner product which is positive with respect to simple roots. And every root, every positive root, can be written as a linear combination of these alpha i's. Then every vector in v is going to have a positive inner, uh, it's never going to be perpendicular to any root. OK? 
Okay? So any, any element in C0, so if I have some V in C0, then V alpha is different than 0 for every alpha. <coughs> That's clear again because if alpha is positive, then alpha can be written as a sum of ki alpha i, and v alpha is therefore the sum of ki alpha alpha i. Now, all of these numbers are strictly positive, and these guys are non-negative, and at least one of them is non-zero. So this is at least uh, a positive number. It's, this is always positive. And if alpha is negative, the same thing proves that this thing is negative, but it's never zero. So this means that C0 is included in VR minus this union of the, or all of these T alphas. It's never, it, it does not intersect T alpha. <clears throat> all right, so, so since the chambers were the connected components of this, then it's enough to prove that this thing is connected. So it's enough, enough to prove that C0 is connected. But this is trivial because C0 is a cone, so for any, it's actually connected by, 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 by intervals, by lines. So for any uh, A and B in C0, the whole segment containing A, so T A plus 1 minus T B, for t being between 0 and 1 is in C0. And that's a trivial exercise. Just take this inner product with alpha i for each alpha i and check that that thing is positive. <coughs> so if you have this connected, it's connected by interval, so therefore C0 is connected, and therefore C0 is a chamber. OK, so, so what's the outcome of all of this discussion? You give me a, a root system. And you have this vector space, and you get a finite set of chambers. This is, these are finite sets of connected components of this topological space. And one of them is marked once you choose a simple root system. So I have this finite connect, uh, connected set. And as soon as I choose a, a simple root system, ah, this one is the fundamental one. OK? <clears throat> All right, so the theorem is this. So theorem, the vial group the Weil group Weil, uh, acts simply transitively on the connected, on the set of Weil chambers. So the Weil group, so the set of Weil chambers is a torso for the vial group. Uh, OK, so let's prove that. Transitiveness is very simple. Uh, the fact that it's simple is not so simple. So let's prove the transitive condition. <coughs> OK, so what I need to prove is that, so to prove transitiveness, I need to check that. For any two chambers, Ci and Cj, there exists an element of the vial group such that that guy applied to Ci is equal to Cj. Simpleness means that if I have an element of the vial group that fixes Ci, then it's trivial. Well, it fixes Ci for every high, then it's trivial. Uh, or that, in other words, that this W is unique. But let's prove this first. Uh, so, OK, so it goes like this. So you have your chambers, whatever these chambers are. And this is CI. Here's your CJ. If CI is equal to CJ, then there's nothing to prove. You can take the identity for, for W. If CI and CJ are different, just choose any path joining any point in CI to any point in CJ. <clears throat> then
they are in di different connected components. The only condition that you're going to require on this path L is that L does not intersect intersections. So if you do T alpha and you do T beta, this is empty for every alpha different than beta. Okay? So it's allowed to pass through T alpha. It's allowed to pass through T beta, but it's not allowed to pass through the intersection of T alpha with T beta. And you can always do this because the intersection is of co-dimension one in T alpha and in T beta, so you can just move a little bit your path to avoid an intersection. That's something you can do on real vector spaces. You can probably not do on finite vector spaces. OK, so it's clear that this L exists, and it joins x with y by a path that passes through some of these t alphas. And it needs to pass through these t alphas because, well, these two guys are in different connected components. If you never pass through any of the walls, then your x and y are going to be on the same connected component. So enumerate them. So now just choose a direction in your path. And now you enumerate the routes that you pass, alpha 1, Alpha k are the roots, the t alpha i's that L crosses in order. But then what you realize is that r alpha, uh, k was the last one, alpha k, r alpha k minus 1 up to r alpha 1, applied to the point x, well, this is some point in Cj. And w was a continuous function. So it says connected components to connected components. It's a linear function. So this means that you define this guy to be w. Therefore, w sends all of Ci to Cj. But it has to send connected components to connected components. So this is close to here. Right? So R alpha sends all of this CI to a another connected component that is just across this thing. So it would send the connected component that contains this point to the connected component that contains this point. That's what R alpha does. And now you just continue going until you reach here. And then again, R beta would send the connected component that had this one. Since you didn't change your connected component, that's the same connected component that had this point. And then it would send it to the connected component that has this point. And by avoiding this, this situation, then you know that you started with this. This was in the same connected component as this. This went to this. It is in the same connected component as this. It, wins, it goes to this, and eventually it lands in the last one. It lands in the connected component where, well, where the last point was, which was the last point is in the same connected component of y. So it, this, what you proved, is that it lands in the same connected component where y is, which is cj by definition. OK. <clears throat> yeah, I don't like arguments using continuity. Uh, it would be nice if you give me a combinatorial argument for this. I do not know how to do that. Well, I don't like combinatorics either. But yeah, actually, I probably dislike combinatorics more than than analytical arguments, but anyways. It is the way it is. I, I do not know other proof of this statement. <coughs> uh, by the way, so Jethro uses, I think, a segment, uh, which I don't think you can do, but anyways. All right, so we have this statement. Uh, so that proves that there exists one W that sends CJ to CJ. And notice, so this is already enough to prove what we set out to prove at the beginning of the lecture, that, that was that the, the Cartan matrix and the Dinkin diagrams do not depend on the choice of simple roots. Oh, well, that, no, they do depend. They, they do not depend on, on f. Uh, but before doing that, let's finish proving this theorem. So this theorem says that this w needs to be unique. OK? So <clears throat> for that, we need to do something more. Uh, and I will need a lemma. So. Let's say that an expression for w is reduced. Now we choose a simple root system. 
and let's suppose an expression for w is si1, sik, is called reduced if k is equal to the length of w. That means k is the minimal number of elements that you can, that you can use to express w. Okay? So the following lemma is the exchange lemma. If you have an expression like this for w, uh, let's suppose that it's not reduced. So, so you have an expression like this. And let's suppose that uh, si1, sik, sik plus 1 applied to, well, let's do this like this, perhaps. Let's suppose that this w applied to alpha, oh, shoot, i, k plus 1 is negative, then s i 1 up to s i k, s i k plus 1 is not reduced. In fact, we want to prove something stronger. We want to prove that if this situation happens, then there exists some j, which is bigger or equal than 1 and is less or equal than k, such that si1 up to sik plus 1 is equal to si1 up to s uh, i j minus 1, then s i j plus 1. So s i j is missing here, and s i k and s i j, s i k plus 1 is missing there. There's a typo in Jethro's notes. Uh, the determinant needs to be the same on both sides. Uh, in Jethro's notes, he's forgetting this SIK plus 1 on one of the sides. Uh, or, so I want to prove this statement. Okay? So this guy has two elements less than this side, so this, one, this was not reduced. Okay. That's very simple. So what you, what you do is you define this, uh, this uh, set of roots, beta r, to be, you start with si r plus 1 up to the last one, which is si of k and apply to alpha i k. Uh, alpha i k plus 1. So that's the definition of this bit, bit r. Okay, so this is for every r between zero, I guess, and k, and k minus one. Uh, no, and k. So beta zero is what we started from, which is s i one up to s i k applied to alpha i k plus one which I am assuming that this thing here is negative. And beta k uh, apply is equal to just simply alpha i k plus 1, which is in pi, therefore is in delta plus. So there exists at least one j such that beta j minus 1 is in delta minus, and beta j is in delta plus. Okay. So we started with from beta 0 up to beta k. We start from a negative root, and we land in a positive root. At some point, we needed to switch from a negative to a positive.
OK. So well, notice the definition of this beta r. So if you look at the definition of beta j, do I want to do beta j or beta j minus 1? I'm always like, OK, it doesn't matter. So this definition of this, this beta j is that it's, you start with j plus 1, you end up in ik, and you apply to alpha ik plus 1. And beta j minus 1, you start with s ij, and then you apply this thing. So, so they satisfy this condition. OK, but beta j minus 1, I'm saying that this guy is in delta minus. And this is in delta plus. And we've proved that simple reflections had this property that they preserved all of delta plus minus Sij preserves delta plus minus alpha Ij. So it, it permutes all of the positive roots except the simple root Sij that it sends it to minus that. So it means that if I have a positive root and I land in a negative root, it means that this beta j had to be equal to alpha ij. Okay. All right, so now beta j, we know it's alpha ij, but beta j by definition is this guy. So what we know is that if I define this guy to be ah, W is a bad idea. I've already used the letter W. So if I define this guy to be W prime, then I'm saying beta j is W prime times uh, alpha i k plus 1 is equal to alpha i j. <clears throat> OK? Any questions? All right. So now, <clears throat> remember we had, a, we had a theorem. Well, we had a lemma that said that whenever you give me an, an element in the orthogonal group, A, R, alpha, A inverse was equal to R, R of A uh, of alpha. This is what we proved. And now I'm giving you an element in the orthogonal group that applied to this root. It gives me this simple root. So I can use that. And hopefully, I'm going to get the right one. But I'm going to read this with A being this element. And hopefully, it's going to be that element that I need and not the inverse of that element. Uh, but anyways, we, I, I reserve the right of having to do the same thing twice. So I'm going to use W prime to be A. And therefore, this guy to be alpha. OK? And then this guy is A of alpha. So what I'm saying is that R of A of alpha, which by definition is S, I, J. Yeah, and of course I'm going to get this wrong. Well, it doesn't matter. S, I, J. I'm claiming that this is equal to uh, A, which is W prime. Uh, R of alpha, which is S, I, K plus 1. W inverse. W prime inverse. Okay, so that, this equation is that equation there. Uh, okay, so let's multiply both sides by W prime on the right. And I get Sij W prime is equal to W prime Sik plus 1. And let's multiply both sides by on the left now by Si1 up to S I1 up to Sij minus 1. So multiply by this, I get Sij, and then W prime, which is Sij plus 1 up to Sik. Okay? And then on the right, 
I get uh, SI1 up to SIJ minus 1 times W prime, which is SIJ plus 1 up to uh, SIK. And then finally, I have an SIK plus 1. Yes, I, I indeed screwed up what I called A and A prime. It doesn't matter. I'm going to multiply both sides on the right now by SIK plus 1. So if I multiply by SIK plus 1 here, that's cancelled. And here I get an SIK plus 1. And this is what I wanted to prove, that this thing is non-reduced because it has an expression with two guys less. Okay? So that's the statement that I wanted to prove here. <coughs> OK. so. So we have this lemma. If, if you have an expression for w that takes a simple root and it gives you back a negative root, then you get that this expression with an, an sik plus 1, so the simple root that you're adding, it's non-reduced. So now let's finish the proof of the theorem. Suppose that you have some w that preserves the chambers. Okay? So in particular, it preserves the fundamental chamber. To choose any simple root system. The fundamental chamber is the A chamber for one root system. So in particular, your W is going to do this. Okay? So let's suppose that the, the action is non-simple. Well, no, it doesn't matter. Let's just take a W that preserves the fundamental chamber. And let's take a reduced expression for W. So W can be written as an SI1 up to an SIK. Suppose that W is non, so K is equal to 0 and W is the identity. If there's just W the identity, that's this. But if W is not the identity, then there's going to be some non-trivial expression like this. And now let's take a simple root system, a simple root. Okay? So if I take a simple root, so W of <coughs> alpha I is equal to SI1 up to SIK applied to alpha I. And since this guy is in C0, alpha I is in C0. Oops, I'm sorry. Right. We have exactly, it's exactly the opposite uh, thing that I want to do. Uh, I'm going to take an element that is, yeah, this is exactly the opposite of what I wanted to say. So let me just write this correctly. Mm. So let's, what we know is the following. I am going to apply W to alpha I, and this is this thing here. And I'm assuming that this expression is reduced. So since that expression is reduced, remember that if I do this and I apply to IK, for that expression to be reduced, this thing here needs to be in delta plus. Okay, so that was that was the the condition. Otherwise, the lemma tells me that uh, this expression was not reduced. <laughs> right. So I want to prove that there's no way that W, that there's no non-trivial W that satisfies this condition, OK? And so I take a W. I write its reduced structure. Uh, so by, by contradiction, let's suppose that there exists such a thing. And this one is reduced. So now what we've learned that this expression being reduced means that if I looked at SI1, well, uh, if I look at this, 
and I apply it to alpha i k, then it cannot be negative. Because the previous lemma said that if this was, was negative, then this guy was non reduced. So this guy has to be a positive root. <clears throat> okay? And I claim that this is absurd. I claim that this is absurd. And this is absurd because, uh, because W sends chambers to chambers. So in particular, I, what I can do for this W is apply this to alpha IK, which is what we did. So you grab your W that sends C0 to C0, and let's apply it to a simple root, alpha IK. Okay. <coughs> and then that thing is equal to minus uh, alpha I1 up to alpha IK minus 1, apply to alpha IK because SIK on alpha IK is minus alpha IK. And this guy thing, this thing here is in minus delta plus, which is absurd. Okay. So that, that's a proof that this thing cannot exist with a reduced one. So this one was an absurd to be reduced, so therefore this W has to be the identity. Okay, I think I have just enough time, so let's prove Uh, oh, that was just the definition of this W. Uh, oh, no, I'm missing. Uh, no, this is correct. So this is minus that. I'm sorry. Uh, this is minus that. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. So uh, what do I want to prove? Right. I want to prove that the main theorem for today. I want to prove that the Cartan algebra, the Cartan matrix, and the thinking diagram do not depend on F. OK, so let's do that. Uh, so the first observation is that the notion of the fundamental chamber is equivalent to the notion of the simple roots. OK, so first observation, fundamental chamber It's completely determined once you choose the simple roots. Ouch. It's determined by F. Remember, this fundamental chamber was all these vectors that were positive with respect to all, that had a positive inner product with the fundamental roots. But notice also that uh, once you have this, uh, then as long as f is in that chamber, then if you move, move, oh, wait, no. f is an element in this dual. This is our, our construction. But we have a non-trivial inner product. So v dual is isomorphic to v, and this is a natural isomorphism. You have a map from V to V dual, which is does this. And this is naturally defined because this guy is non-degenerate. Okay? So now I can identify uh, this F as some V dot. Moreover, the fact that F of alpha is non-zero for every alpha tells me that V is not in T alpha for any alpha. Moreover, the fact that once we've chosen F, it gave us a fundamental chamber, that tells us that V is in that fundamental chamber. So once you choose F, 
you get a vector v that is in the fundamental chamber determined by f. And again, this is just a trivial statement that we are saying that f gives us this linear functional, and it's positive on positive roots, so therefore it's positive on simple roots, and that means that v inner product with any simple root is positive. So all of these statements are absolutely trivial. The choice of f determines a fundamental chamber, and it determines a vector in that fundamental chamber. And of course, v determines f by this formula. So what you notice is that if you move v within the, fundament the same fundamental chamber, you do not change the fundamental chamber, and you do not change the set of simple roots. So if you choose any other v, other v prime in the same fundamental chamber, you def determines f prime, which is v prime dot, determines the same root system. The same simple root system. So fundamental, so chain, a choice of one chamber is equivalent to choosing a, funda uh, a fundamental system, uh, a simple root system. <coughs> okay, so now, uh, suppose that you choose different ones. We've chosen some f, so we have this v delta, and we chose some f in v prime. This gave us some v, and we choose another one, f prime, and this gave us some other v prime. So this determined one fundamental chamber, and this determines a different fundamental chamber. Let me call this ci. But by the theorem, we know that there exists w. It's unique, but it doesn't even need to be unique at this stage. We know that there exists an element in the Weyl group that sends one fundamental chamber to the other one. In particular, it sends this v to a vector here. And this w is an automorphism of v. It preserves, it preserves the inner product of v. And it permutes these roots, it doesn't matter, but it just preserves the root system. In particular, <coughs> since the Cartan matrix is defined by a formula that only depends on the inner product, and W is orthogonal, Again, I reserve the right of having the right matrix or the transpose. Apply W to that thing, and it's going to get the same. It's going to be the same. Namely, two W alpha i W alpha j over W alpha i W alpha j alpha i. So this is the root system that you get from choosing f. And this is the carton, matri the carton matrix that you get from choosing f. And this is the carton matrix that you get from choosing f prime. So it's the same carton matrix, and it's the same, uh, and it's the same uh, thinking diagram, therefore, after just permuting uh, the, the roots just to label them like this. W alpha i is the simple roots corresponding to alpha i. OK, so that's the proof that things do not depend on f. There's one subtlety, which is the following. So this is, I am assuming that V, that you, you have two Lie algebras, and you've chosen the same uh, space V and the same delta. So now what happens if you start with a Lie algebra? So the construction was like, as follows. You started with a Lie algebra G. We made one choice which is the choice of Cartan matrix, of Cartan subalgebra. This is a choice. There could be many Cartan subalgebras. Once we've chosen this thing, it gave us delta and V. In particular, this space V is isomorphic to H. It's H dual, but it's isomorphic to H by the inner product. Then we've chosen F, and it gave us this pi. 
and it gave us the for the garden matrix and it gave us the thinking diagram. <clears throat> now let's suppose that you start with another Lie algebra, G prime, you choose a carton matrix, a carton subaltra H prime. This gives you your root system delta v in V prime. And then you choose your F prime. And it gives you this. And now let's suppose that you have an isomorphism of Lie algebras here. So I want to prove that you get the same things here. <clears throat> but, but that's going to be false because an, iso an isomorphism from G to G prime does not send H to H prime. Okay? So if I have an isomorphism that sends H to H prime, then this root system maps into this root system by that isomorphism because I can identify H prime H star with H prime star here and then by what we just proved, this thing doesn't matter if I chose F or if I chose F prime. It doesn't matter which simple root system is. So the only, the only problem is that this works whenever the isomorphism from G to G prime sends H to H prime. Okay, but last time we proved the following. If you give me an isomorphism, then that isomorphism sends H to some other H second prime inside of G prime. And there exists an automorphism of G prime now that sends H second prime to H prime. So the composition of these two is just uh, what you want. That's it. Okay, so that's it. I have no clue what I need to prove next time. <laughs> I've been looking at the lecture notes. Typically, I would be talking about the universal enveloping algebra. I think Jethro is talking about free algebra. So I think I'll just use lectures. Uh, I'll use Jethro's lecture notes, and next time I'll be spoke, speaking about free algebra.